Madam Clerk, uh, the Transportation and Commerce Committee will now come to order. Will you please call roll? Alderman Vicaro? Present. Alderman Middlebrook? Present. Alderman Narayan? Here. Alderman Evans? Present. Alderman Schweitzer? Present. Alderman Grass. Present. Chair Cone. Present. Thank you. We have seven present, a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I would also ask STLTV, I'm the chair. Please don't, uh, I don't know who's muting me, but so like, if you could leave me off mute, that would be great. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm not doing it. Okay. Um, so we uh, have on our order of business today the approval of the minutes. Uh, we've, I'll entertain a motion that we approve the mi meeting minutes from our Tuesday, October 18th meeting. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, it was uh, moved by the alderman from the 23rd ward, seconded by the alderman of the 24th ward. Madam Clerk, will you please call roll? Alderman Vaccaro. Aye. Alderman Middlebrook. Aye. Alderman Narayan. Aye. Alderman Evans. Aye. Alderman Schweitzer. Aye. Alderman Gross. Aye. Chair Cone. Aye. Seven aye votes. Thank you. Uh, with that, you approve our meeting minutes from October 18th. Um, the only other item that we have on our agenda for today is the continuing discussion on resolution number 110. Um, the sponsor of that is uh, Alderwoman Middlebrook. Uh, Alderwoman, uh, I know you kind of uh, kicked us off last week. Um, we did have a pretty robust conversation last week with respect to the resolution. Um, I know that uh, SLDC has a presentation that they've put together since they weren't able to um, provide more specifics around the uh, evaluation criteria for uh, the incentives. Um, I'm not sure if you want to introduce them or if you want me to just uh, have them start their presentation. You can just have them start their presentation. Thank you. Okay, uh, Director Richardson. Yes. Thank you, Alderman Cohn, uh, again, for the opportunity to come before um, this committee today to speak about our analysis yes, um, that has been put come forth on. and shared. Lots of mover over now. Thank you. Madam Clerk, you're not muted. Thank you, sorry to share uh, the analysis with the committee. Um, and as a reminder, the Port Authority has not approved um, any tax abatement for this project um, at this time. Again, we have put forth a recommendation uh, for tax abatement up to a specific amount, which Zach and Jake will go into deeper detail about. Um, but based on our initial analysis and the sources and uses um, for the proposed development plan, we performed this analysis and provided um, a overview and the scoring of the project itself uh, for both phases. Uh, so I will pass it over to Zach and Jake to give a deeper overview of the project um, a summary, and then I will conclude the presentation before passing it back over to uh, the, the chair of the committee. Zach and Jake, please take it over. Uh, so I appreciate the opportunity um, to present to you all today. I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Um, I do have a few slides for you. Uh, so I think kind of to frame this at the beginning um, and to provide a little bit of background for anyone who maybe hasn't seen us present one of these recently. The way that our model works is we're basically trying to wrap our arms around um, the proposed use in the project and then project over time um, 
the revenues that that project would generate from basically all sources. So we'd be looking from uh, property tax revenue to payroll tax, uh, earnings tax, and sales tax, personal property tax. Um, and this kind of influences, you know, the schedule of abatements that we would provide. Um, the developer here is proposing what is kind of objectively a pretty enormous project. Um, $323 million of investment would be a big project anywhere in the city. Uh, it would be a big project in the heart of the Central West End. And it's certainly a big project in one of the northernmost parcels of the city. Um, when comparing that to the revenue that those 67 acres are currently generating, obviously it's kind of a different order of magnitude. Um, so I don't think there's any doubt about this scoring well, um, but we can certainly dive into the numbers uh, and kind of how we modeled this. Because there were so many different uses and all kind of being phased in at different points, we actually modeled this as two phases, kind of a 1A and a 1B. Um, the 1A is basically the 300 room hotel, as well as the 80,000 square foot water park. Um, and there's a conference center in that hotel as well. And then the 1B would be the kind of boutique hotel with condos, um, and then the marina and some attached retail. So currently the 67 acres, which does exclude the um, gas station at the southwest corner, um, generates about $16,700 in property taxes every year. Um, so that's about $250 an acre, uh, half a penny a square foot. Even during the abatement, and we modeled this over 15 years, kind of on a waterfall schedule, uh, five years of 90%, five years at 75% and then five years at 50%. Even kind of the first five years with the deepest abatement of 90%, uh, we're projecting about $450,000 in property taxes for these parcels. Um, as that abatement burns off, that number increases. So during that middle period, it's about 1.4 million. During that 75% abatement period, as we get down to 50% abatement, we're at two and a half, 2.7 million and then up close to 6 million or so after the abatement would end at year 16. Uh, the property also generate about $20 million in taxable sales uh, between the marina and the water park and the retail. Um, and we did receive some updated employment numbers. So we went from about 450 jobs the last time we spoke to 511. Uh, the payroll increased from I believe it's 12 and a half to about 17.9 million. Um, so it's about a 40% increase in payroll and a 15% increase in the total number of jobs created. Um, here's a bit of a breakdown, a deeper dive on those jobs. Um, so as you can see, the kind of weighted average annual wage has gone up to a little above 35,000. But the vast majority of those jobs are kind of hourly jobs. Hey, 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 Jay, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but you your slides are not moving on the page. We're still on the project summary section. I apologize. Um, can you see kind of the main PowerPoint document now? No, we can't see any, you're not sharing anything now. Oh. Just wanted to make sure that was publicly. Yeah. Yeah. Are we back in the main PowerPoint? We're back in the PowerPoint, yes. And we're on the- There we go. Uh, all right, perfect. Um, so this is a little bit of a deeper dive on the proposed jobs. Um, 511 total of those, 76 are salary and 435 are hourly. Uh, you can see the salary jobs on average pay a little over 56,000 a year and the hourly is a little above 31,000. So that drags that weighted average down to about 35. Um, we did break it down by that 1A and 1B. The 1A is kind of the column you see on the left, uh, the 1B, the column on the right. Um, so salary jobs range from 48 to, uh, there's basically one or two jobs at six figures, um, kind of a resort manager position uh, for an average of a little over 60. And then on the other side, the salaried average is a bit lower at 48. Um, the hourly position is 13 to $18 an hour um, at the water park and hotel, 12 to $18 an hour at the marina uh, and retail. And you can see how all those averages kind of shake down. Um, and that's so we're a little over 37,000 uh, for phase 1A, a little over 32 for phase 1B. And we get that average around 35. And so here is, did my slide change, by the way? Yes, it did. Yes. 
Um, so here's kind of a top line summary of all of the projections of the model. You can see that real estate program on the left. This score is a five out of five, um, which is to be expected, honestly. Uh, it's a massively underutilized site at this point, and we're projecting you know, significant investment. Um, of that 323 million, 280 is hard costs. And so you can see on the left side um, how that would shake out for our MBE and WBE targets. So that's about 67 million to minority owned businesses, a little over 30 million to women owned businesses at those 24% and 11% thresholds. Um, over the 20 year, we project the value of the incentive and the value of the benefits over 20 years, um, just to make sure we're capturing everything. Um, so over the value of the abatement as a net present value of about 35 million uh, to the developer, a nominal value, if you just add them up about 56.7. We also modeled the uh, sales tax exemption on construction materials based on those hard cost numbers, about 8.2 million. Um, the fiscal benefit uh, to the city is a little under 9 million over two years, increasing to 21 million over 20 years. Obviously, the, the incentive here is a, a real property tax abatement. So, a lot of the other, and the school district is the primary beneficiary of those. So. The fiscal benefit over 10 years is 5.4 million. And you can see that big jump at 20 as that abatement starts to burn off and eventually go away. Um, all of those values are calculated using, I believe, a 3% discount rate for a net present value. Um, the city is also benefiting from you know, payroll taxes and earnings taxes, and, and both the city and school district are benefiting from the portion of the sales taxes as well. Um, so I do have the model, what we call the dashboard um, for kind of the 1A and 1B phases here. There's not a ton of information here that isn't summarized in the previous slides, but I do want to show them to you because I think this is kind of what folks are used to seeing during these analyses. Um, I'll try to zoom in a little bit. I realize I'm not in an ideal place here. Um, a lot of those top line fiscal benefit numbers I just showed to you are just adding this fiscal benefit to the city over 10 years of A, fiscal benefit over B, and that's how we got to the numbers I just presented. I think this graph can be a little bit misleading at times, and there's kind of a, a feature of the model um, that makes these this way, so to speak. Um, the way the model was designed by my predecessor compared all these projected uses to kind of the average of that strategic land use, um, both in the neighborhood and citywide. So the strategic land use for this site is SMUA, uh, which is specially mixed use. This creates kind of a benchmark to measure new uses against. And specially mixed use is probably, I would say, the most intense revenue intense use in the city. So a lot of the Central Corridor, a lot of uh, Central West End, um, it's obviously designed for kind of residential, above retail, mixed use, things of that nature. So I don't want kind of the fact that this is, and this is all done on a per square foot basis, and this is a massive site. And we use the full 67 acres to assess the site. So I don't want the fact that kind of our project revenue line is below this gray line to be misleading, that city average line. That's the average revenue projected per square foot for the specially mixed use, strategic land use city wide. And so that was a lot of acronyms on all words, but the revenue here gets a bit watered down, essentially. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not obviously incredibly impactful, um, very meaningful. And orders of magnitude, not even in the same kind of area as where it is right now. Um, and so from a financial, and I realize this is a small portion of this total analysis, but from a financial perspective, uh, this performs extremely well. Uh, so at this point, I've kind of deferred to Neil, and I'm happy to answer any questions that y'all might have. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jake, uh, for this overview um, and that deep analysis. Um, as Jack, uh, uh, Jake laid out during the presentation, this project is significant to activate a parcel that's currently only generating close to $16,700 in annual property taxes, having the potential uh, even during the first phase of the uh, the tax abatement period of 450,000 
all the way to six million after the abatement period runs off. We will even be contributing over the first 10 years over nine million dollars as a as a physical benefit um, to the to the schools itself. Um, so I think those things need to be taken into consideration as you all make your decision on this, but also um, we understand that we want to address any environmental and other challenges um, that this project may face um, and, and ensure that community partners are um, aware of this um, as well as working uh, strategically with uh, the, the city and other, other city agencies um, the fire department and otherwise to ensure that the safety of our residents as they utilize this space and other visitors utilize this space are paramount. Um, but overall, we believe as, as the city of St. Louis and also um, as this project was presented um, to the mayor's office, um, creating you know over 500 jobs and being able to have a tax revenue um, to support the overall growth of our city is beneficial. Uh, but again, we wanna make sure we do our due diligence. The Port Authority is in place to ensure that we continue to do our due diligence before entering into a redevelopment agreement to uh, provide these incentives to any developer of this site. Um, but I wanted to, again, make it well known that SLDC is in support of moving this project forward as it will activate a parcel in the most northern area of the city um, in a way that will provide uh, revenue and economic development activity uh, for the city of St. Louis, um, including all of our tax, all of our taxing districts. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it back over to uh, Chairman Cohn if you have any questions specifically for SLDC. Thank you, uh, Director Richardson um, and Jake. Uh, appreciate your overview here. Um, I thought I turned my camera back on. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and take questions from the committee. Uh, Alderman Vaccaro. I'm sorry, I, I really have no questions. Okay, uh, Alderman Narayan. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Cohn. Uh, just a quick question for SLDC. Did did the um, the financials that you were looking at did it take into account the I guess roughly half a million dollars that uh, that went into this project uh, in the terms of the the clean fill? So the as it, as it relates to the the clean fill uh, itself, that five hundred thousand dollars was bidded out by B BPS. Uh, we had a conversation with BPS about that. Um, when there is um, no place for a fill, we put out a contract for it. And the only respondents was the current owner of the site. Um, and so they entered into a contract with them. So there was no uh, really support from the city outside of a contractual agreement for us to be able to, uh, to put fill there. We understand that there has been remediation that's been done as well as continuous um, site testing to ensure that the site is no longer contaminated. Um, but that's that has that was not taken into consideration as it relates to the five hundred thousand dollars that's been received at this site in that current analysis. I don't know if Rob, you have anything else to add, but that is um, the the knowledge I have today. Oh, I would just add that um, short of this uh, property owner responding to the RFP that the Board of Public Service put out, the city might have had to pay significantly more to haul the material to Illinois or someplace out into the county. Um, this is from construction debris, sewer work, um, water work, and, and those types of projects. And that $500,000, and I don't know if one of the developers can speak to this, but, you know, it's not just getting paid to accept dirt. You have to have heavy machinery to move the dirt, to level it out, to spread it. You have to compact it, which is also involves heavy machinery, and you have to test it continuously um, for Department of Natural Resources to be in compliance with the fact 
that you are in fact accepting only clean fill and not contaminated soil. Sure, no, and I, I understand that and appreciate that. I was just curious if the financials took into account that the, you know, the taxpayers of St. Louis already paid a half a million dollars for this, uh, uh, the, the land here to get raised to the, the place where it uh, needs to be for a project of this type. Um, and then, uh, so I know Alderman Cohn at the last uh, meeting asked for a little bit more of a breakdown on the, uh, on the jobs. Um, so it looks like that the average hourly wage for those jobs is 12 to $14 an hour. Um, for a lot of the hourly jobs, it's, yeah, essentially. Um, I would say that, I mean, it works out to a weighted average of 1475 to 1550. Um, but there are certainly jobs that are below that range. A portion of those are tipped jobs. I would say a portion of those are servers and bartenders. Um, and we obviously don't take you know, tips into account the financial model. But um, to answer the question as directly as possible, I would say, yeah, there's a significant number of jobs in that kind of 13, 12 to $14 an hour range. Thank you. And then, you. And then uh, uh, Mr. Orr, uh, just to get back to you real quick, uh, talking about the, the, the clean fill aspect of it, you, you mentioned that the site needs to be compacted and, uh, you know, that takes heavy machinery, you have to do uh, testing on it, things like that. Has anyone from the city been out and inspected this site to see if things are in line with where they should be? I would let the developer answer that question. I'm not sure of what inspections are done whenever um, clean fill is is moved from one location to another and deposited, but um, maybe that's something that someone from the M2 team can address. And uh, Alderman Narayan, can we try and keep the questions to the presentation that SLDC, there's a, a litany of other people, the developer included, along with some other stakeholders that are going to give presentations. So uh, you know, if, if we can just keep the questions to the, uh, the presentation itself, that would be awesome. Sure, sure. Then, then I'll withdraw that question uh, and uh, we can move forward. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Okay. Alder, Alderwoman Evans, any questions no, about qu the presentation? No questions. Okay. Alderwoman Schweitzer. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the time and effort that went into putting the presentation together. My questions really have to do with uh, environmental impact of the project. And I just don't feel like I've gotten answers yet about what, what that will be. Um, it doesn't look like that's considered really at all in what we were presented today. Uh, I know you said at the end that it is a concern, but it doesn't sound like it's been considered in your analysis. and you know, I understand that this is a very different type of type of project than a lot of things that I've personally seen in my time on the board. Um, so I, I'd love to hear you speak to that aspect, uh, if you can. Yeah, so what I would speak to directly as it relates to um, SODC and the Port Authority is that we have uh, the, the only resolution that has been placed before the Port Authority Board regarding this project specifically is around entering into an agreement with the developers for the Port Authority to actually review those development plans in depth, understand the impact they will have on uh, the port, um, including the Mississippi and those environmental issues. We have an agreement in place that we will continue to monitor and over, have an overview and insight into that. We have a count, Council Gilmore and Bell that will be working uh, very closely with the development team as that's being produced, which is why we had to enter into this agreement um, to ensure that the city and the port wouldn't be on the hook for covering those soft costs associated with that monitoring and that due diligence. Uh, but we will be part of that process along the way um, in, in ensuring that we address those environmental issues um, and raise those within the Port Authority um, as this project uh, comes back up for actual consideration for 
tax incentives. Again, this is in this moment, we're just seeking the Board of Aldermen to provide their support um, for the tax incentives related to the economic activity um, as develop as the development plan actually comes into clear vision um, on some of those studies and the environmental impacts, those things will be addressed at that time. I appreciate that. It's it's tough as an older person to have that be the answer. Uh, we don't have a ton of input, you know, past this time and and wanting to make sure that I'm not ignoring the very real concerns of my constituents uh, about in the environment and, and, and considering my vote. I do look forward to hearing from Edgewater about the marina and whether or not, you know, what, what they think about that possibility of a project. I imagine they'll they'll say it's possible, but we'll see. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to getting more information. I appreciate everyone being here. I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then Alderman Gross. Uh, I just have a quick question on the, the jobs breakdown. I mean, do we have a list somewhere where he, where he talks about 28 salary position and then 203 hourly positions? You know, is 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 that a list that was provided like by the developers with who all those are? Or, or do we have that list somewhere we could see? Yeah, we sure do. Okay. And I guess and maybe this would be a question, you know, since it's from the developer for you know marine people, I guess I'd be, you know, was I mean, are there the you know positions on this marina? I mean, are are these all just we talk about salary positions, hourly positions, are these all just people that are employed directly by the marina? Or are these, you know, did you do you get any numbers from the developers or anything about? you know, other um, independent contractors and such that might be uh, based in just, the marina. It's all employed by the marina, no spin-off type jobs. So these well, are okay. yeah, I would say the marina and the, the water park is a big part of it. And I think um, certainly when we're talking about those hourly wage jobs, a lot of those are concentrated in the water park. You've got, you know, concession folks and ticket takers and things like that. Um, this doesn't kind of have the indirect or induced employment. Um, this is more just stuff that's tied directly to the project. So, you know, diesel mechanics, that kind of thing that's not on there? Correct, yeah. Okay. That's, and also, this is an inclusive of the construction jobs um, that also will be created as a result of this project. And I'm sure the developer can speak to that um, during their portion of the presentation. Uh, but as because this project, again, is receiving, if, if we move forward in this direction, if it receives tax incentives, they will also have to abide by the various ordinances for women and minority owned business enterprises, prevailing wage, all of those various efforts as it relates to construction jobs. Um, so we have some, again, some regulations around that um, and ordinances around that to protect um, the, the construction jobs associated with this project, um, Autumn and Gross. All right, thank you, that's all I have. Thank you. I, I know we have another uh, bunch of colleagues that aren't currently on the committee that are on the call. Um, I will allow you all the opportunity to ask questions a little bit later. Um, we have a number of folks that I know have time constraints that I want to allow them the opportunity to be able to, to, uh, to speak this afternoon. Um, so the, the kind of flow of order here, uh, next we'll have the uh, developers, because uh, Edgewater was not available at last week's committee hearing. Um, and uh, after them, we'll have uh, Colin from uh, Missouri River, uh, or Mississippi River uh, Cities Town, MRCTI. Uh, and then uh, I believe we've got a representative from the zoo here as well, um, Billy Brennan, uh, who would like to speak. Um, and then from there, I'll take questions from members of the committee and other colleagues that are on the call. And then we can get into um, the list of other folks who have signed up for uh, discussion today. Uh, with that, uh, if the developers are available, I, uh, Edgewater specifically, uh, if you could Get sworn in by the clerk here. Uh, yes, uh, of course. Uh, thank you, Chairman. 
Uh, greetings to all. Uh, uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak on, on behalf of the project. Uh, Mr. And tell, and tell Mr. You Patel, all I have to swear you in. I'm sorry. Sorry. Do you, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Well, I was just uh, trying to thank you all for, for the opportunity to present to you the various project. We've, we've been involved uh, as a track record uh, and obviously uh, talk about your doubts and, and concerns uh, over this waterfront uh, master plan. Uh, for, for, for starters, Edgewater and their team members have over 400 projects uh, in the world uh, from Singapore, uh, Europe, uh, Mediterranean, uh, South America, Mexico, the Caribbean, the States, uh, Canada, you name it, we probably have done it. Uh, there are certain specific conditions that I'm sure pose concerns on, on, on some of you here today. Uh, that might be, you know, the dynamic river conditions uh, that that are presented for thanks of the Mississippi River's uh, geography and 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 waters. Uh, we've worked in several other similar and probably in some cases tougher conditions uh, with in terms of currents, water fluctuations. Uh, sediments, uh, wildlife, marine and wildlife preservation. Uh, there are a bunch of examples that I would like to show you in, in first on, on a video and, and then on a couple of PDFs that hopefully would, would see where, where we're trying to get this project uh, to, right? Uh, let, me, let me share my screen. I will try I will try to show you first a project in in Lake Michigan. Screen number two. This is a hundred million dollar uh, infrastructure, marine infrastructure project in Lake in Lake Michigan. Uh, in, in Chicago, particularly, it's called 31st Street Harbor. Uh, the, the, conditions, the conditions here are extreme in the winter. So this, this was uh, designed to be one of the greenest harbors in the world. In fact, it won an award. This is a 1100 11, uh, boat marina designed to withstand whatever climate condition you can find in Lake Michigan that freezes. And when, when it's winter time, you have probably 24 foot waves splashing the breakwater that you see on the outside. There's the time lapse of the construction. We've performed, to, to be able to do this, you have to perform in this case, it was a huge project with a huge budget uh, to, that allowed us to perform indoor uh, simulations that would uh, provide the, the necessary conditions for the, for the ultimately the design of the, of the marina project, right? Another thing that I, I've heard uh, older woman Sch Schweitzer uh, discussing about was the environmental impact of the project. Here, this is a great example of community engagement with a resilient environmental impact, right? Because this was like a plain field that overlooked the water. But when, when we presented the marina idea, we came up with a plan to, to put an elevated park, right? So that people don't miss the opportunity of really seeing Lake Michigan and, and also the boats, not just the boats, right? So what we enhanced the project with was the native species to recreate the, the natural ecosystem for, for local wi wildlife. 
birds uh, and, and other smaller animals as well. This is all a drip irrigation system. There's geothermic, geothermal uh, heating. There's water consumption reduction. There's low flow water fixtures. This reduces like the water usage in 65% approximately. Uh, so this is a, a, an intensive project done in the, in the city of Chicago. We've also worked in, in some other large scale uh, projects that one of these is this Brooklyn, it's in Brooklyn Bridge Park uh, Marina. This marina was designed, there, there, were, there was a period of about, let's say 20 years approximately where New York City in the different boroughs didn't allow any marina. It allowed the Sedgewater as a master developers to create this extremely beautiful, internationally renowned uh, facility that we used to, to create a, a harbor where you have smaller boats and very large mega yachts. That's, that's probably not the case for, for the St. Louis project, but this has a very interesting component that this is on a very, this is on the Hudson River. So it's one of the, probably the most transited rivers in the world. So you have tugboats, you have commercial shipping, large, very large commercial vessels. You have ferry terminals, you have, you know, Coast Guard, uh, you name it, you probably have it in, in, in this environment, right? And one of the things that's very interesting here is that we worked with the local communities to create a, a, an asset that, it, that is a boat club and, and a canoeing club and a kayak club, because one of the concerns of the people was, where are we gonna boat, right? Where are we, the small boaters, the, the canoers, the, the, the small sailboats, where are we gonna go? Is this, is this gonna be something for the ultra rich of, from New York City or, or is it something that we're gonna have a space as well? Well, we gave them a space because we listened, we worked with them along the process as, as a private party on top of whatever engagement might have been done by the Army Corps of Engineers and the other federal regulatory bodies. We work with the community to give them a piece of the pie, right? To give them a piece where they felt that they could fit inside the project, right? So, so everybody's happy. This was this is again 31st Street Harbor in Chicago. You can see here the elevated park. We also work in the intracoastal waterway. Uh, uh, we worked a lot there. We have an office in Pompano Beach in Florida. Uh, this is a mega yacht facility in the town of Palm Beach. This is a $40 million project. Uh, again, the intracoastal waterway is extremely heavy traffic. The difference is that we have mixed waters here because it's not, you know, fresh water is a mixture between fresh and salty that creates different issues for the marine infrastructure. But again, it's a beautiful project that brings a lot to a town. See, this is heavy traffic in a heavily uh, transited area, you know. This is Las Olas Marina in Fort Lauderdale. We also participated on the wet slips here and, and the reconversion of, of the uplands. Uh, this is again in the middle of the intracoastal, very close to it for Lauderdale Inlet. We participated in a couple of projects in, in Argentina. I wanna show you a video specifically for this because this resembles the, the, the conditions of the Mississippi River. This, this has a water, this river is the Parana River. It extends for probably 14, 1400 miles right from the southern part of Brazil, crossing Paraguay, crossing Argentina and going to the Atlantic Ocean. So this is a 1700 boat marina, dry stack marina, semi-automated one with where the water fluctuation of the river because upper in the river when it gets to Brazil and Paraguay, there are a couple of, of electrical dams, huge electrical dams that when those reservoirs are, are emptied, uh, 
the river gets flooded and the water fluctuation here is over 23, 24 feet. It's not overnight, of course, but, but the marina has to keep working, you know? So what we create with these semi-automated facilities or automated facilities is the possibility of not using forklifts and reducing the contamination of, of the rubbers and the tires and, and, and the exhaust and, and, and all that, right? We use electromechanical system guided by, by computers. This is another project in, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, the, the same type of, of semi-automated facility that we saw before. This is a fully automated facility, dry stack facility in Fort Lauderdale also, right, right in the, right two minutes away from the inlet. This is a marvelous example of, of what we can achieve with, with certain technology because this is not a boat barn. This is something that brings value to, to the adjacent uh, real estate. Uh, and this is also category five hurricane. So we're used to designing in difficult environments whatsoever. Uh, we have cases in, uh, in Ridgeland, Mississippi. This is uh, back in 2005. This is a 500 boat facility. We created, a, we all, we start usually creating a feasibility study, then a master plan, then executive phases, then the operation, right? That's how we work. That's how we work. And we also do grants, permitting, uh, and, and continuous uh, improvements on, on the lifetime of the project. This is again La Solda's project. This is uh, the project in, in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, this is a project in a reservoir adjacent to a river in, in Maryville, Tennessee. The, again, this is a thousand acres. Uh, this is a shipyard that, that we've developed in San Juan in Puerto Rico. Uh, let me see where's the other case that I wanted to show you. And there are a, a bunch of more heavy uses that we usually plan and design. We do coastal engineering all the time. Uh, so we do wind, wave, currents, depths, uh, flushing, sediments, dredging, environmental impact assessments. You know, uh, all of these aspects are key to designing whatever facility we're involved in, right? This is uh, the, the river, the, an Indian river uh, terminal in Fort Pierce where we provided different types of engineering for, for the project and, and feasibility studies to see if they... The town could be doing certain specific projects. Again, Puerto Rico. This is in Rochester, New York. This is the river mouth that connects to, to the lake in upstate New York. Uh, what we did is work with the, with the city to transform a formerly a parking space into, into a marina and retail, a mixed use facility that looks beautiful right now. Uh, we worked in, in Port of Waukegan in Illinois. We worked a lot there. Uh, this is again in, in Brooklyn, in New York City, uh, uh, a ferry terminal. It's called a roll, roll, roll on, roll off, where those ferries were where you can put your car in or a motorbike. Uh, Hey, uh, Nabil, oh. uh, this is Tim. Yes. Hey, um, one of, let, let's, uh, I think you guys have clearly established um, an incredible litany of completed projects. I'm, I'm thinking that if we do have a hard stop with some folks at four o'clock, it may be good to have some people that have questions uh, specifically that you guys can address, because I know in our last meeting, most of the questions or concerns were related to the marina. And uh, I fell uh, fell way short on providing answers that uh, you know you guys can clearly do. So may I suggest that uh, you know depending on uh, what you all want to do is to open it up to questions so that we can you know get those answered by the professionals. Perfect, of course. Happy to to start answering. Yeah. 
I, that's actually my call, but I appreciate that, Tim. Uh, it seemed like we were starting to go around it a little bit there. Um, I do want to uh, make sure that we have uh, two other guests that I, I said would be able to uh, uh, say something earlier on in the meeting. Um, Colin, uh, if you're still on, uh, would appreciate it if you could uh, get sworn in here by the clerk and share your perspective here. And then after that, we'll have Billy Brennan from the zoo. And then uh, we can take questions from the committee members and other alder people who are on the line of SLDC, Edgewater, the developers, or any other party that's uh, yeah, spoken this afternoon. Certainly. Mr. Willing, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Wellingkamp, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Colin Wellenkamp. I am the Executive Director of the Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative, MRCTI. We are an association of 102 United States mayors along the entire length of the Mississippi River from Bemidji, Minnesota to New Orleans, Louisiana. We are headquartered in St. Louis. My office is just two doors down from City Hall. Mayor Tashara Jones and previous two mayors before her have all been uh, active members of our association. Uh, we have a very strong partnership with SLDC. In fact, we're hosted in their suite and uh, Neil said it best uh, when he said um, in this process, they wanna make sure that they bring aboard uh, the right partnerships and talk with the right partners and make this project as sustainable as possible. Uh, that is uh, our role in advising on and helping our member cities with projects like this uh, when called upon to do so. A number of mayors from the St. Louis region have asked MRCTI to voice uh, various concerns. MRCTI is not uh, anti-development by any stretch. We are simply pro-smart development. Uh, especially when it comes to the vulnerabilities involved in developing near water communities uh, and around a resource that is a complex ecosystem and environmentally sensitive like the Mississippi River. Some of the concerns that our mayors have asked us to voice uh, around this, and we have communicated this to the mayor's staff uh, as well in, um, uh, for in uh, Mayor Jones's office, and will continue to be a resource for both them and Neil as this process unfolds, really has to do with a lot of the sustainability, disaster risk and resilience and mitigation and uh, ecosystem, um, uh, ecosystem impact. Uh, that's where the concerns of our mayors uh, have to do. So uh, we have a number of mayors that would be indirectly impacted by this project other than St. Louis. Uh, Grafton, Alton, East Alton, Illinois, West Alton, Missouri, Madison, Granite City, Sauge, all the way down to Kimswick, uh, have uh, several of those cities have, have voiced concerns. I'll just go through them very quickly because I know time is sensitive. Uh, one of them uh, being that uh, although we appreciate Edgewater's uh, extremely diverse experience and uh, highly capable portfolio, there are only uh, two other rivers on earth like the Mississippi, and that's the Yangtze and the Amazon. We know the Paraná very well. We work with the Paraná River Basin. They're a major food producing river basin along with the Mississippi. Mississippi's number one uh, and have worked with them and Brazil uh, very much in the past. Trust me, nothing is like the Mississippi uh, except the Amazon and the Yangtze. It has a 40 foot ebb and flow in the middle reaches of it. Uh, it, is, it goes through extremely dry periods like now with record low levels uh, going, breaking the 30 year low set in 1988, uh, all the way to record high levels such as 1993 and 2019. It's also subject to dramatic flash flooding and rain events like the thousand year rain event that occurred throughout the region just this past July 26th. Uh, so, this creates some very dynamic environmental conditions that developments need to be aware of and plan around. Uh, for instance, 
uh, what is the disaster resilience capacity for this project? Can it withstand a significant 100, 200, 500 year flood event like 2019? Uh, what are the techniques that are going to be employed to onboard those disasters and absorb risk on site instead of putting up flood laws, riprap, and levees to push risk down to other member communities? Uh, for instance, it would be a shame if the project used flood walls and other non absorbent, non mitigating techniques that are on site to push risk down to Hartford down to uh, Sauge, Granite City, and Madison, and let them deal with the problem. Uh, in, in, instead of that, a retention basin could be part of the project to allow water to fill up during high water periods and retain water to keep levels stable during dry periods like now. Uh, what are the oil spill, engine fluid, and other dangerous chemical spillage abatements staff and training that are gonna be onboarded with this project. Mostly when you have fuel uh, and effluent leaks from uh, boating vessels and the machinery operating them, the first few minutes of a spill is critical. Will there be personnel on site 24 seven to deal with and mitigate that? We have a, a plastic waste reduction program within our association. Marinas are one of the top using shrink users of shrink wrap in the country. What is the shrink wrap recycling capacity of this project? Will there be uh, the ability of waste management, both biological waste and plastic uh, and non-organic waste uh, recycling uh, attributes and capacities built into the project? Will those services be offered to boaters uh, and marina owners 24 seven? Will the buildings uh, that are planned for this site, will they be tall or will they be low impact? The Mississippi River is the most significant flyway in the continent. Tall buildings interrupt that flyway, uh, especially when they're in, uh, when they're in uh, wild areas like this one, uh, like this area, or will they be lower impact? low lying rounder buildings uh, that don't interrupt the flyway. It's also one, the flyway is also one of the biggest outdoor recreation revenue generators of the, of the corridor. Uh, will these be uh, platinum certified structures? Uh, will they be sustainable buildings using minimal amounts of water, minimal amounts of energy? For parking and other surface transportation assets associated with the project, will these be permeable surfaces? to allow um, flash flooding and runoff to percolate back into the soil, or is the plan to let all of that runoff and all of the chemicals that it would catch go straight into the Mississippi River and let neighboring communities have to deal with that problem? Uh, are there abatement capacities uh, being onboarded with this project that can limit that? Uh, and then finally, are there alternative energy production capacities built into the project? Marinas are some of the best places for solar capture uh, technology and, and uh, renewable energy because they don't have any shade issues to deal with. Is that part of the project? So these are uh, a number of concerns that our mayors have come to uh, with us. Uh, there have been some suggested capacities to be put into, into this project, such as, uh, not just a retention basins near the project, but putting in wetlands or a marsh uh, just above or just below the project in order to mitigate risk and control water levels and, and mitigate for flooding. With a 40 foot ebb and flow on the Mississippi River, truly, truly, you can spend $300 million in a development two to five years later, you can have a major disaster wash it all away. Our mayors have seen this firsthand up and down the river in recent years. And that's why our mayors are working together to mitigate so much of this risk and just and, and make it not just development, smarter development. The Green Business Bureau, green certifies marinas. One of the few entities that do, that's a credible third party. We would encourage the developers of this project to reach out to them, look at the capacities that they can certify for and the benchmarks that they use. 
we are committed to working with Neil and his team and Mayor Jones and helping all of our St. Louis regional mayors find a good place to be in support of this project and to help it along. Don't wanna be a hindrance, we wanna be helpful and make sure that whatever money is spent and what other assets are joined to the St. Louis and the people of St. Louis that it doesn't just wash away in the next disaster or isn't, isn't destroyed or hurts our drinking water. Don't forget, 20 million people, 50 cities along the Mississippi River drink that surface water every day, including me, my wife, and my two little girls. I'm sure we would all be feel much more safe and secure if we're, we know that this marina is a smart development, keeping the water clean instead of letting us drink that. So think of us as a resource. Think of us as here, an extension of your own staff, Mr. Chairman, to help you through this process. And we stand ready to do that. And I wanna thank you for this opportunity. Okay, thank you, Colin. I appreciate that. Uh, I believe uh, Billy Brennan from the zoo is also on. Yes, I'm here. Billy, uh, do you mind uh, being sworn in by the, the clerk here before you provide your testimony? I do not mind. Great, thank you. Mr. Brennan, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, everyone here today. I appreciate you allowing me to represent the zoo today to speak on this resolution. My name is Billy Brennan. I'm the Director of Public Relations and Government Affairs for the St. Louis Zoo. Um, after um, our first meeting with the M2 group yesterday, there are still a lot about this project that we just simply don't know. And that would prevent the zoo from taking any position at this time, either in support or in opposition of the resolution. As many of you know, the St. Louis Zoo is in the process of a $230 million development called Wildcare Park that sits on 425 acres in North St. Louis County, just up the road from the potential site for this Lighthouse Point project. And it's just north of Alderwoman, Middlebrooks Ward. Um, with Wildcare Park in the county and with the zoo here in the city that has property in both Alderman Grass's ward as well as Alderman Narayan's, uh, we will continue to operate both of our campuses under our mission to conserve animals and their habitats through animal management, research, recreation, and educational programs that encourage and support and enrich the experience for the public. Because of our efforts at Wildcare Park, uh, we've observed that the Lighthouse Point project worked to date and at our October and an October meeting convened by County Councilwoman Shalonda Webb, which was held at Wildcare Park. We learned more about the current plans for this project. And at, during yesterday's meeting with the group from M2, we, we walked through some of the questions as a conservation organization that we have relating to a wildlife preservation, conservation, flood management, traffic studies and other key elements that we believe are not only central to our mission here at the St. Louis Zoo, but also important for the entire region. With that I say, we are hopeful that we can get some answers to some of these questions that uh, were discussed yesterday with the M2 group. And, and trust me, we, we believe that more economic development in North St. Louis City and in North St. Louis County will benefit the entire region with additional po potential benefits also for the zoo and for Wildcare Park. However, we do need to have more information to take any position on this project at this time. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Brennan. I appreciate your time this afternoon. I'll go ahead and uh, start taking questions from members of the committee. Uh, and this is for anyone that's uh, so far given uh, you know, a, a presentation or, or remarks this afternoon. Um, so that would be SLDC, the developers MT2 or Edgewater uh, or any of their representatives along with, uh, is Colin still on? I, I, I see, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, and also any questions that you might have of, uh, Colin uh, or uh, uh, Billy uh, Brennan from the zoo. I, I see 
I, and forgive me, I, I don't have your name pulled up, but the representative from Edgewater, uh, you had your hand raised. Do you have a- Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted uh, to use a couple of minutes to respond because probably what, what uh, uh, Colin mentioned raises, uh, you know, it, it, it's a sum of, of whatever municipalities in, in the in the Mississippi River are, have concerns, you know, and that's something thoughtful. And, and, and I just want to, to use this valuable time to respond to, to his doubt, doubts, because uh, those doubts are probably more, more uh, to come from, from the rest of the, of, of the people here listed to, to speak. First of all, I just wanted to make sure that we all know that getting approvals for these type of projects is extremely complex and it is highly regulated by the federal government of the United States. So uh, it's usually led by the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, but it also goes to Fish and Wildlife. It also goes to Coast Guard. It goes to FEMA for disaster mitigation, flooding and so forth. Uh, you know, Department of Natural Resources, all that at a federal level. Then it enters state and city levels that you have to go to different processes according that, that might look similar from city to city, but they essentially vary. You know, they have certain variations for, for specific cities, like in the case of St. Louis. Uh, we, as you have seen our, our several presentations, uh, we've achieved those internationally renowned standards like the Green Marina, uh, Green Marina Awards or the Jacques Cousteau Awards. That's like the Nobel Prize for marinas. Basically, we have awards in, in 20 or 25 of our design of our projects. Uh, so if the, there are some obviously technical concerns, some operational concerns, uh, I would like to address them as a whole uh, and stating that this is, this is obviously, as I was saying before, a highly regulated procedure, okay? That the developer together with the engineers of record and the professionals of record provide input to those uh, federal authorities or, or, or local authorities in a case by case basis where the info goes back and forth until all requirements are completed. There's nothing left behind, okay? There's no open ends. It all gets completed because if not, you don't get an approval. And that, that also implies that there are gonna be instances for open to the public, you know, in, in, in those processes. On top of whatever we as, uh, as, as the engineers or, or, and, and the developers might open ourselves to the public as well, right? So that, that for sure, there are, uh, there are certain uh, concerns that, that Colin presented about the height of the buildings, uh, of the, what's gonna happen with the, when the boats are there, what's gonna happen with the plastic wrap, what's gonna happen with, the, with certain uh, wastes or first, before opening, we provide the facilities with operating plans that you know what you have to do. What happens if somebody has a heart attack? What happens if there's an oil spill? What happens if you know there's trash on the pontoon? What happens? All the what ifs, that's a maintenance and operation plan. But that's once the project is finalized for sure. So we can obviously include certain aspects of, of, of uh, so other types of, of, of electromechanical or, or engineering solutions in terms of sustainability for the development. Of course, on the planning side, on the design side, when we start, we do all these type of technical studies. I was, as I was saying earlier, uh, wave motion, uh, current, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where we have a huge, huge amount of information that we use to 
iterate and redefine the, the project until it's up to all the standards that, that we want and the, the city wants and the community wants, right? That's, that's how we operate always. So uh, putting a marsh in front of the breakwater, yes, of course, it can be a solution for sure. For sure, it is a solution that we use in many places. In, in places that we have uh, sea coast, we usually uh, try to reduce as much as possible the impact on, on whatever wildlife do we have on the submerged lands, on the seagrass, on the manatees, on whatever you name it, the turtles, you know. Uh, it, it's a, those are all tricky environments. So we obviously know how to work in those environments and give the best to the environment as well, you know? So if the buildings are gonna be two stories or five stories, I, we don't really know yet. It, it hasn't been defined neither by the city officials, neither by the developers, nor by us. We wanna do what's best for everyone, especially for the city of St. Louis. So- uh, Okay, I, thank you. So I, I, I've given you quite a few minutes of uh, yeah. personal privilege there to explain that because you know there are certainly going to be more questions from the committee and wanted to afford them the opportunity to uh, hear what you have to say. Uh, before diving into questions here, but I'm going to, again, uh, kind of get back on track with the agenda here and provide members of the committee the opportunity to ask any questions that they have of, you know, either SLDC, Edgewater, you know, or other representatives of the development group, um, or, you know, Mr. Wallenkamp or uh, Mr. Brennan, you know, the three or the, you know, kind of four entities here that have uh, you know, given their opportunity and time and talent this afternoon to be here. Um, so with that, I'll uh, go through the, the roster here of the committee members first, and then I'll open it up to members of the Board of Aldermen who are also present. Uh, Alderman Vicaro. I, you know, I, I really have no questions, I'm fine. Okay. Uh, Alderwoman, well, Alderwoman Megabork, I'll give you the opportunity to ask questions if you have any. I have none, thank you. Okay, uh, Alderman Narayan. Thank you, uh, Chairman Cohn. Uh, quick question, and I guess um, Colin may be the uh, person to, uh, to answer this, just going off the kind of subject matter he was speaking about. Um, what, uh, at, at what point, because I, I continue to feel like we may be putting the, the cart in front of the horse here, particularly on environmental issues, because once we sign off on these, uh, you know, we lose the local control of this project at least. Uh, my biggest concern is not the development on the, the land uh, with the water park and the hotels and things of that nature. It continues to be the marina, uh, particularly its uh, uh, proximity to our drinking water intake. Um, uh, my understanding is that our, our water intake is just south of this project, meaning that if uh, there were issues with, uh, you know, boats, uh, you know, having accidents, anything of that nature, or any oil, gasoline, diesel, anything like that, that would get into the water would then uh, uh, be fairly close to our, our drinking water intake. And uh, that's a big concern, uh, I think, for, for everyone in the region. And I'd just like to know a little bit more about that. Sure, so you, you want to know a little bit more about the concerns that our mayors have voiced in, in that regard, or concerns that we, we, we respond to just holistically on the Mississippi River around drinking water? Uh, I'd say both. So uh, I'll go top to bottom, uh, Alderman. Um, so it's, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is a, of concern. Like I said, we have 50 cities on the Mississippi River that drink that water every day. Um, major metropolitan communities like St. Louis, uh, like the Quad Cities, uh, like the Twin Cities, um, all drinking that water. And uh, so what, especially when developments are near wa major water intake or um, 
uh, water purification plants. Uh, additional concern is, is taken to, to make sure to protect and mitigate for any potential spills or effluent. Whenever you are a development and you're going to, and, and Edgewater, Edgewater will be very familiar with this, other projects that they've done in the United States, um, whenever you're going to implicate uh, runoff or any kind of effluent that is point source, uh, that is a point source into a navigable water of the US, you need a NIPTES permit from the EPA, a National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit from the EPA. That's for point sources. But, and that's great. However, for non-point sources where it's just runoff everywhere and it's not a particular point, then that's where our usual problems really come from. And that's where the biggest risk is mounted. So uh, there's a lot less reg there and a lot less federal requirement. So that's when things like the state would step in and the host community would step in and say, hey, what are the capacities that are going to be onboarded to make sure that the non-point source effluent of this project is not going to implicate our drinking water intake system just a few miles down the road? Uh, well, it's not even that far. So, um, you know, it's a major point of concern that's shared by communities up and down uh, the Mississippi River. I would say in our, in our cohort, the communities that have mounted the biggest risk and had the most experience in dealing with that, sometimes not very successfully because of economic pressures, is uh, our Louisiana communities. Um, because it's the largest concentration of chemical production in the United States between uh, Baton Rouge and New Orleans. And we have a number of cities that are in that, that thoroughfare and they're drinking that water. And it's been, they have, they have shared a lot of techniques, a lot of war stories with the Roger Association on how do you protect that? How do you put yourself in a position? And one of the ways that they always say that one of the things that those mayors have told our other mayors up north, get into those concerns as early into the process as possible. Um, you can't get into it early enough. And they wish a lot of times those mayors were brought in at the end of the process where there wasn't hardly anything they could do about it. Um, the, you guys are in a great position. You guys are in a very, very powerful position to onboard those concerns very early. And that's where our Louisiana mayors wished they had been in the past. Um, so that's, that's sort of the 30,000 foot view. And then the a uh, lower level view is um, the St. Louis region is extremely surface water dependent. It's a surface water dependent region, both on the Missouri and on the, uh, on the Mississippi. I mean, it's a unique confluence zone of the continent. The Missouri, the Illinois, and the Mississippi create complex ecosystems all over this region. There's only one other place in in the Mississippi River system, or excuse me, two other places in the Mississippi River system where that takes place. And that is in uh, Southern Minnesota near the, near the confluence of the San Croix, uh, although that, that ecological area is in distress. And then the lower river uh, in, uh, in Louisiana. And that ecological area, of course, has been in distress for a very long time. So it's, it, that complex ecosystem creates a lot of environmental services for this area, for agriculture especially, uh, but also drinking water and then freshwater manufacturing. Pepsi, Coke, Anheuser-Busch, General Mills, all big users of fresh water. We only use about 650 million gallons per day um, uh, for drinking water in the, in the region for the Mississippi, off the Mississippi River. Uh, the manufacturing industry on the whole Mississippi per day uses 8 billion gallons with a B. That's a lot of jobs. That's a big freshwater community. That's a $430 billion uh, economy annually. So we don't want to just protect our drinking water. We also want to protect our manufacturing capacity too, which implicates a lot more jobs. Just happens to be that that manufacturing is for products we all consume. So clean, fresh water is critical. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. 
Uh, and for the, the next question I have, uh, I'd like to direct to uh, Billy Brennan, uh, if he's available. Yeah, okay, I see him there. Um, so uh, what concerns does the zoo have as far as the, the proximity of this project to what the zoo is doing? Uh, I know that you said that you're going to have some endangered species there. I know that I've heard in other discussions there'll be migratory birds, things of that nature there. Um, can, you, can you expound on some of the uh, some of the concerns that would be specific to the mission that you have there? Sure, sure. No, thank you, uh, Alderman Ryan. Uh, you know, again, I'll, I'll preface it by saying it's still kind of early, right? I mean, we haven't really had enough conversation or enough planning and dialogue. So I want to start with that. But to say that just the simple things of really being a good neighbor and including the native wildlife is super important. You know, just the simple name of this project is a lighthouse point and a lighthouse means light and light. We have to consider light pollution, you know, and we are in the Mississippi flyway. So, you know, migratory birds, bats, butterflies, you know, all kinds of things that are flying by, you know, we do have to consider what that could have an impact on the native wildlife. Um, but again, that's just an open concern with questions that deserve time for answers, right? Um, on our end, you know, we're about a mile and a half north of this property. And so again, if I stick to just, you know, lighthouse, you know, we will have some very endangered and threatened species that we're just trying to keep on this planet you know, on this, on our property, you know, just north of here. And, you know, we'll, you know, if a light is shining, that could impact them too. But and that's just, just light. But for all the other concerns that have been brought up by other parties here too, and what could happen, you know, thinking us also as the fact that a, re, a, a big reason why this project is coming in, I would think is because they also fell in love with this region, like in this neighborhood, this is a great part of our region. And, um, and we appreciate that, and we 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 are very hopeful that we'll see see um, great economic development in this area. But if there's things that are done on this property that cause um, issues with Riverview Drive, um, you know the tourists that are going to come up to Wildcare Park may have to go a different route, and they won't pass up this property. You know, and so we have to address the fact that Riverview Drive is the closest way up to Wildcare Park and down to then where this is, but. I do see lots of synergies too. So I, I do want to end here with a positive and say, you know, we're only going to be able to have as many people as the glamping opportunities we have. So I see great opportunity for a project like this that's offering a hotel. Um, Cause I mean, just think of it, you could have a wedding reception at Wildcare Park and then just go right down the road to a hotel. That's awesome. I mean, we do see some great opportunities there, but again, I, I think with this one, um, Alderman, that the, it just, it's going to take a little bit of time to just figure stuff out. No, I appreciate that. And I, I realize that, uh, you know, this is a, a newer project for you guys. So I do appreciate the, uh, the willingness to weigh in on it, uh, even though you don't necessarily have all the, uh, the everything that you'd like to have in front of you. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, and then the last question I have is uh, for Edgewater. Um, you know, I think a lot of us remember uh, back in 93, the 67 acres that this, uh, uh, parcel sits on was underwater and remained underwater for quite some time. I know that it uh, has been built up with the the fill that we were discussing earlier. Um, it, it was brought up a little bit earlier. Do, do you have plans or are there, uh, is, is the, the idea to build as much of uh, you know, parking lots, uh, roadways, things of that nature with permeable surfaces so that uh, we're not dealing with uh, an incredible amount of runoff because the, the 67 acres that you built up there, um, I mean, you, it, when the river floods, it used to hold 67 acres of water. Uh, and now that water is going to go somewhere. Uh, and I'm just trying to figure out how much, if any, uh, this site will continue to hold. Yes, uh, Alderman Narayan. Uh, we plan to use as many resources as possible to mitigate uh, potentially ad, you know, potential adversities uh, and potential 
uh, reductions of, of uh, water uh, on, on the site. Uh, we we want to, one of the resources that could be easily done is creating some sort of retainment pond or, or something that obviously highlights the, the uplands of the project, <laughs> but also also serves as a retention pond for, for mitigation of flooding. Uh, and obviously using permeable surfaces uh, we, will help. But again, we are, we've been going to a site for five years now. We, when, once we start the executive phases, when we see uh, the, the, clear, the clear paths uh, to move forward, we are obviously going to propose as many solutions as possible for the different uh, potential issues that, that we might need to overcome in this particular case. I, I appreciate that. Thank you for that. Yeah, my, my concern is, I guess it's remained the same this whole time. I just feel like for me personally, at least, and I can't speak for any of my colleagues, I, I just don't feel like I have enough information on the environmental aspects here to be supportive of this at the moment. Uh, it, and particularly the marina aspect of it, the, the water aspect of it. I have no issues whatsoever with a hotel on that site, with a water park on that site. I think that's great. Um, my big concern is this marina. So my question to Edgewater, uh, it, it'll be my last question, is uh, if you don't get the, the local, state, and federal approval for this marina, is the whole project scrapped? Or do you intend to move forward with uh, a, ho a hotel and water park? How, how dependent uh, is this project on the marina? Well, si since, since we have done this so many times before in the States, all over the States, and for you guys to have an idea, in many cases, the, the Army Corps of Engineers is our client. It's not that we present papers to the Army Corps for our development, right? It's not only that. But in many cases, the Army Corps cannot solve certain issues and contracts Edgewater to solve them. So we believe that if we comply with certain regulations, right, and certain uh, aspects of, of or technical aspects of, of the project, we are going to be able to do a marina in, in this site. That being said, if you know an act of God happens and, and, and we are not able to, to do the marina, we will still create an enhanced waterfront for the people of St. Louis. Marina less, right? But, but it's, it will still be an enhanced possibility for the people of St. Louis to enjoy their beautiful waterfront to the Mississippi River. Thank you for that. And uh, I have nothing further. Thank you all for your time and for answering my questions today. Thanks. That's what we're here for. Thank you all. Uh, Alderwoman Evans. <clears throat> Thank you. I've heard a lot today. I have no questions, just a comment. And that is that I appreciate uh, Mr. Uh, Colin Wallenkamp's comment on preserving the safety of our drinking water, our clean, fresh drinking water. And I also look forward to the development of the marina in this section of the city. It's overdue, it's wanted, and I would love to see the development take place in North City. That's all I have to say, comment. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Alderwoman. Alderwoman uh, Schweitzer. Thank you so much. I appreciate the, the information that we've gotten from everyone today again. Um, you know, the comment made about 
if an act of God happens, you know, what, what will happen? Uh, you know, unfortunately, so many of the, so much of this crisis that we find ourselves in with climate change isn't an act of God. It's an act of man and decisions that governments have made uh, for generations. And when you're in a government role and in a seat where you have, you know, as much control or as little control as we have here at the St. Louis Board of Aldermen and trying to get these environmental questions answered. And yeah, I, I the more I hear, the more concerns I have, the more I'm concerned that this could be a, a, a huge mistake. Uh, and it is very uh, difficult to be in a position where you have to make decisions like this because we are making these decisions for years to come and in the knowledge that our constituents, the taxpayers of St. Louis are, you know, hoping that we're making decisions with all the information that we could possibly have. And in this case, we're asked to make a decision and just sort of cross our fingers and, and hope that we're not making a devastating environmental decision. Um, and and it, is, it is very tough. I don't, at this point, I know I have a lot of other colleagues who want to ask questions, so I will wield my time back. Thank you, Alderwoman. Uh, Alder, Alderman Grass. And Grass. Uh, yeah, I have a, a few questions for Edgewater. Um, I kind of want to talk. We, we, there were in the previous meeting, we, there was a lot of discussion beyond the environment of also just the suitability for the site for boating. Um, I, I so I want to talk a little bit about that and kind of what the plan is. Um, I found, and I don't know if this is helpful or not, or I don't know if you're familiar with the site, but in the handouts, I, I did find the Army Corps of Engineer um, map, like the, the chart for the section of, of river. Um, and, you know, if you're familiar with it, th this sits right north of the Chain of Rock Bridge. And, you know, the more I've kind of looked about it, talked to other people about it, thought about it, I mean, everybody is is, you know, convinced that that well, of course, you're no one is going to go over the chain of rocks bridge. Like, there's that that's just not navigable. And when you look at the um, the map from the Army Corps of Engineers, it's pretty clear. There's a big sign right there, just south of this project, just south of 200, 270, that um, you know navigation is not recommended. So, you know, I guess my questions is. You know, is the plan just to to have the marina at this point and then keep everybody north? Um, and if so, you know, what 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 kinds of things do you guys put in place? I mean, I'm I'm assuming if you've you've operated marinas maybe next to other you know hazards before, um, you know, do you what what kinds of things will you put in place to to you know for for safety purposes to kind of keep people you know, north, if that's the plan. And if your plan is that, that you know, people could, could, could vote over the chain of rocks, then I think I'd have other questions too. Well, uh, Alderman Grass, uh, th thanks for the question. That, that's a really interesting point. Uh, there are a lot of potential uh, hazards, uh, let's call it, in, in marina design, when you design in challenging environments like, like this part of the river, uh, we've designed our projects in the States. One is up north from Niagara Falls. Uh, so, uh, and, and there was like zero, zero boaters going through the, through the Niagara Falls, right? So uh, I, I don't believe people, uh, are gonna go boating on, on the chain of rocks because that would be suicidal uh, or, or probably very complicated for 99% for of the people. But uh, boating in, in St. Louis is expected to be from the side north into the Missouri River or up to Alton, up from the locks in, in, in Alton, right? There are a significant amount of marina there, marinas there uh, with, all in all in, in wet slips, you know, that that prove a case for what we're trying to do here. So uh, in in that case, uh, I believe that we can certainly do voter education in, in many aspects, 
uh, and provide safety features inside the marina for people not to go uh, not to go south, you know, because there's nothing interesting bo boating south. Uh, I believe that the the best part of, of of these rivers is right on the confluence and and, and up in in both the Missouri and the Mississippi rivers. Okay, so so that does the plan then would be that that from the where the marina is, all the traffic is then just going north. That there would be nothing you you would you're not expecting then anybody to to go south from there. No, no, no. We're we're not expecting anybody to go south. Uh, that will increase hazards uh, in a in an unnecessary way, and, and it's not a navigable part of of the river. That's why the, the service. Uh, canal, it, it's on, on the other side for either larger vessels or, or vessels. There, there's uh, many boaters that cross the whole Mississippi River that do what they call the loop. They go to the to the the Great Lakes and and go up uh, up to the north in the Mississippi River and they go out in Louisiana. So uh, they they go to the Gulf. Uh, uh, and they, they obviously pass not, not through there, but they pass through the service canal or on the side. That's that's the safe way to do it. So the boaters from this marina would theoretically then go north up to the service canal and south if they wanted to go down to the city or something. Exactly, exactly, exactly. That that would be that would be the, the recommended at least uh, from our side. Okay, so the other thing I, I noticed when I looked at the um, map from the Army Corps of Engineers is it looks like there's a, a, a pretty large patch of very shallow water right in front of the site. Um, so I'm assuming that you guys are going to have to dredge um, a lot of the ground up to to be able to you know get the water deep enough for the marina um is that true is that what you guys are planning well we haven't done the bathymetries uh the bathymetry is a study that gives us the water depth right it's a depth sound uh we haven't done those type of studies yet we expect to do this in the foreseeable future and then we're going to have the 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 correct response to 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 your question Probably. So but, how how variable would the costs of this project be then if, you know, I mean, what, is there a budget, and maybe this is a better question for SLDC, but, you know, do we have, do we have a budget for dredging in this project cost? And, and, you know, in your opinion, is this, a, is this an amount that could go, depending on the scope, like very right, wildly or how, how expensive of a, of a proposition is that? Well, usually marine works are expensive by nature because it's a, it's a complexity that you need to have all this paperwork and specific equipment to, to do so. Uh, but it's nothing that, that's going to be preventing the project to, to become a reality if, if that's what, what you, you know, it's not a prohibitive cost. We already ha have a cost of uh, potentially in, having to dredge a part of the site, but uh, but the real implications of dredging were, were, gonna, are, were gonna be defining that after we perform the corresponding studies. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, what, you know, we talked a little bit with SLDC about the jobs that were going to be created with the project. You know, they said they had the list, those were all jobs that would be kind of employees of the marina. Um, I was wondering, you know, are you then foreseeing like uh, contractors, third party stuff, people that are working on the boats, people that are working out of the marina? I mean, is this something that you, you normally see in your projects? Is that, you know, or, um, you know, what you submitted, I understand that kind of, you know, what SLDC based their numbers on was what was submitted by the developers. I guess I'm kind of wondering, you know, how, how you're seeing the, you know, jobs that are coming from this. Yes, the there are. I, I, under, I think I understand your question. There, there are other uh, potentially very interesting jobs that can be created because they are technical jobs and, and 
and obviously need it if you're going to have a marina or uh, and that can on, not only conserve the, the, the this marina but other marinas nearby that's a sort of a boat charge services as a boat repair area let's call it uh, we haven't defined yet if there's going to be a boat repair space because there are probably better sites to do so that you can take easy, uh, the boat out of the water easily and performs the, the perform the whatever works need to be done outside the water and, and in a controlled environment to reduce potential uh, contaminations or potential uh, you know environmental uh, adverse effects what about like the like jobs like like the boat jockeys? I mean, there, we talked, we heard about a big dry dock there. I mean, you know, for people that would have boats parked in the marina on the dock, you know, they call the marina and say, "Hey, can someone get this, you know, gassed up and ready?" I mean, are those going to be employees of the marina? Are those, um, you know, yeah, de depending on the operation plan, those can be employed of the mar employer employees of the marina, of course. Uh, it usually depends on, on who's going to operate the project. We are not marina operators. We are marina engineers and, and developers. Uh, we usually work with, with the largest in America, the largest operations, uh, the ma largest marina operators in, in the country, people that operate 70, 80, 90 facilities, and, and they are in charge of the operation, like, like uh, let's say Hilton would be for a hotel, right? Sure. These guys are professionally marina managers uh, for, for these type of projects. Thank you for that. I guess that I was confused about that. I, I knew you guys were d d uh, building the marina, but I, I guess I kind of was thought you guys were operating it as well. Um, to your knowledge, then, has, has a marina operator been selected? No, 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 not at this point, because marina operators need certain grants to 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 do the operation, like like, uh, like again, a hotel company would need. Uh, they need specific designs, they need specific operation uh, schedules and, and so forth. And that's something to be negotiated uh, closer to, to, to finalizing the executive phases of, of the project. But we certainly can provide, since we work with all of them, we certainly can provide the SLDC or, or, or the city of St. Louis with let's say a letter of intent from several companies that would be interested in operating this type of project. Okay, and I think just one more question, maybe this would be a better question for your eventual operator though, but are are you are we expecting people to be able to live on their boats in this marina? Well, uh, live aboard uh, has, has uh, been something in certain environments. Uh, it's something you can consider in certain types of marinas. I don't know if this is going to be the case or not. It's something that probably would be better answered once once the operator is selected and according to their experience. Okay. Um, I last uh, I have a question for um, M two. Um, I uh, uh, Billy Brennan from the zoo, um, you know, mentioned that they they hope that you guys are good neighbors. And I guess you know my question would be what would would you guys be interested in, in exploring a good neighbor agreement with the zoo um, and, and making that be a part of something? Uh, absolutely. I mean, look, this is, I think, an opportunity for both of us to improve each other's offering and bring sort of more opportunity for people in the region to come visit. So absolutely. I mean, I think the whole idea here is just to create a wonderful destination where we can capture people for, you know, two or three days, potentially in both of our locations. So definitely be open to that. Okay. Um, and I guess my, my final question is actually, I guess, for the chair. I'm, I'm a, and forgive me for being a little new. I guess I'm a little still confused on the, the procedure and the point we're at here um, because there's been some, some testimony that this is just a resolution and we come back and this isn't incentives, but I know there's been other testimony that says this is our only chance to approve this. So I guess I'm kind of wondering where this goes from here and then do, do we get a chance then to approve a final um, incentives in the bill? So this is authorizing the, the incentives for the project. Uh, this would be the last stop from an incentive perspective, the Port Authority uh, 
would be handling it from here on out. So from a board of aldermen perspective and an incentive perspective, uh, this resolution uh, is the opportunity that we would have. There are certainly other processes and other authorities where this would go before, um, but in terms of the the actual incentive process, I believe this is, uh, we would essentially be, you know, authorizing them with this resolution. Okay, that makes um, sense. And, and I, see see the, the... I, I see a uh, hand up, uh, assistant director or, or I think you guys have new titles, vice president, you know, Rob Orr from SLDC. Uh, do you care to weigh in on that? Yes, and thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, what I would say is that this um, committee substitution resolution does authorize an up to amount for the incentives. This is not the final approval. It does have to go back to the port commission for that authorization of the actual incentives. And what I would further state in communications with um, uh, Executive Director uh, Neil Richardson is that you know this incentive resolution doesn't grant the developers the right to build this marina. As Colin has mentioned and Nabil has mentioned, all of these regulatory approvals are necessary. And if they don't get those regulatory approvals, the marina will not get built. The development may go forward, as the bill just mentioned. However, the, um, the, the marina itself will not get built if they don't approve all of the, uh, the regulatory agencies don't approve uh, all of the permits. And what I would also suggest is that uh, the Port Commission, if we are not satisfied when the resolution comes back before the port, that those issues have been addressed, the environmental issues, the water issues, uh, all of that, that the port would not provide the incentive for the marina portion of the project. Uh, the port authority is very much interested in what happens on the river and in protecting uh, our Mississippi, a great asset, uh, as Colin has, has well pointed out. Uh, so the port authority would not uh, entertain the incentives for the marine portion if those environmental concerns are not addressed. And I will just add, and you know, I apologize, this is somewhat you know, um, secondhand information, but I spoke with the water commissioner, Kurt Scobie yesterday, and he has very little concern for the number of boats that are gonna be on the Mississippi and it affecting the water quality uh, for the drinking water and for the residents of St. Louis. Um, there's certainly much more activity on the river from barges, tugboats, and other vessels than what um, this marina project is gonna bring. So, but, you know, we would offer that the Port Authority uh, would not pr uh, provide those incentives for the marina project if these environmental issues are not addressed. Thank you, Thank you for that. And yeah, I, you know, I, the fact that this is a port authority thing, I guess, you know, makes it a little different, confusing. That's all the questions I have. Um, you know, I don't know if uh, also, you know, maybe we could put uh, any kind of um, conditions or anything now I mean any kind of amendments of, of what we'd want to see if we'd want to see someone you know good neighbor agreements with the zoo or somehow phrase that that some concerns would be addressed um, you know I'd be open to, to hearing something like that if anybody has suggestions but other than that I don't have any other questions thank you I Alderwoman Evans I see your hand is raised you're on mute Alderwoman and it, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, I would just like to share a letter from uh, Missouri Senate Senator Carla May. And she sends a letter of support for Resolution 110. And it says, I am writing today in support of M2 Development Partners and their proposed development project, Lighthouse Point and I-270 and Riverview Drive in North St. Louis City. My support today is specifically for Resolution 110 in front of your committee facilitating a property tax abatement and sales tax exemption for Lighthouse Point. This project will be built in the fourth senatorial district, which I represent, meaning call it, uh, Senator Carla May, in the Missouri Senate. I have personally toured the project site 
and met with the principals of M2 Development Partners and discussed this exciting project for the St. Louis region. This project will not only greatly benefit the residents of the city of St. Louis, but will positively affect St. Louis County residents and the entire region. It will serve as a sim stimulus for additional development and investment in this district, in Carla Mays district and the entire St. Louis region. The proposed amenities will open our area up for much needed tourism and visitors to our communities. M2 Development Partners proposed project is a great opportunity to revitalize parts of St. Louis that have long been neglected and encourage economic growth that will attract more development projects to St. Louis County. I am confident that the M2 Development Partners and the St. Louis Board of Aldermen will come to a consensus in, <clears throat> in order for this project to move forward. Please make sure this letter becomes part of the Board of Aldermen's official records and that a copy of this letter is passed along to the members of the Transportation Commerce Committee. Okay, thank you, Alderwoman. Uh, please make sure that that's sent to the clerk so it's uh, put in the records for the, the meeting uh, that we're it having. It was sent, it, it's been sent to uh, Clerk Kennedy. Okay, um, I just want to reiterate that we're currently taking questions from members of the committee and the board uh, of folks. So uh, if there's anyone else that has information to share, you know, from other elected officials or other representatives, please send that to the clerk. Uh, trying to be sensitive of everyone's time this afternoon, but you know, thank you for sharing that information, Alderwoman. Um, do you have any other questions of representatives from the developer or SLDC or other folks that are here? I have no question, other questions other than that I hope that we vote favorably to move this forward for this development. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Alderwoman uh, Pam Boyd. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chair. I, I just need to ask uh, a question. Um, I heard uh, Alderman Gross talk about the uh, a study. Has have we had any more studies done on this project? Who's that question directed to, Alderman? Uh, I guess it's it's done to Mr. Rob Orr. Does is he aware of any more studies that have been done? I am not. I would defer to Nabil and uh, the M two development team on studies. Okay, and so uh, M2 development, has it been any other studies done yet or are we still at the beginning stage of this project? No, oh, I mean, we're, we're basically at the early phase of the project right now. I mean, I think to Nabil's point earlier from Edgewater, once we get direction on this particular component, then, you know, we'll sort of begin in earnest doing all the due diligence on, uh, you know, the various components. Okay, so we're just at the beginning, correct? Yes. Yes, okay. And so uh, I guess this question is for uh, uh, Alderwoman Ingrassi. Would she answer a question for me, please? So, uh, Alderwoman Ingrassi is not a member of the committee, but uh, <laughs> I- Well, Shane, you can answer the question. Is Big Muddy Waters, are they on the river? Are they at, at this area? I, I, I'm i familiar with Big Muddy, but I, I, I'm not familiar. I don't believe that they're physically located. Their offices are located on the river. I believe that they, uh, I, I do know that they use, uh, you know, the river, there's an inlet up north, but uh, I guess Alderwoman and Gracia, will you yield for questionings, uh, questions from the Alderwoman from the 27th Ward? Yes, I'd be happy to yield for questions. Okay, thank you. Alderwoman uh, Boyd, please proceed. 
So is Big Muddy Waters, or are they on this part of the uh, of this area, of this development? Um, I'm assuming you're asking if Big Muddy Adventures, the... Where M2 Development is looking at, do they venture over there, or do they do business over there, or... Um, yes, yeah, so Big Muddy Adventures, I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Big Muddy Adventures does uh, take people out um, on the water um, in this stretch of Missouri and Mississippi, yes. Okay, and so we're at the beginning stage and I'm, I'm really excited because I have so many people that don't know where to live, nowhere in this area has so much insight into this project. So I'm, I'm so happy for you all to care enough about North St. Louis that again, you think that you have all the answers for us and you think that we need to wait until you're ready for us to be able to get something in our community. You have a question. So all I'm asking is this. Why is it such a problem for development to come into North St. Louis? And this is only the beginning. This is not worth And uh, Stop, stop. Mr. Moore just said that it has to go through all the hey, older woman or I'm asking a question. I know. I believe she stopped yielding for questions. So. No, I'm not talking to her. I'm asking Mr. Orr said it has to go through the hoops before it can, even though if we say we'll go with the, the, the well, tips or tax or whatever, if they don't follow the guidelines, it still won't pass. So that's my only question. I'm just trying to figure out why are we doing all this drilling and this is only the beginning? That's my question. Okay, so she stopped yielding for questions. I wasn't talking to her anymore. I was through with her. Who are you asking the question of then? Alderman? I'm asking anybody. anybody that can answer that question. Alderwoman, why I, are we going through these hoops if this is only the beginning? That's all I'm trying to find out. This is an opportunity, as you'll, I'm sure you're aware that you know it's a legislative body. We're all elected to represent our constituents and the city, and they're. I'm trying to be fair and affording everyone an opportunity to ask questions as it pertains to the project. And I'm trying to be also uh, mindful of time. I was supposed to be at a neighborhood trunk or treat half an hour ago. I was going to try and can, you know, keep this meeting to about an hour. I'm allowing people the opportunity to ask questions of the representatives that are here. When we had our hearing last week, there were a lot of questions that were very pertinent to this project that didn't have answers. And that was from SLDC. We didn't even have Edgewater here. You know, so now is the opportunity for our colleagues to be able to ask these questions. If if this were something, you know, anywhere else in the city, you know, and and I do want to be very cognizant that this is not just something, you know, that's happening up at, you know, Union and Natural Bridge, you know, or Union and 70. This is literally on our riverfront. It's a very ecologically sensitive part of our city and our ecosystem. And so, you know, to have the opportunity for people to ask these questions is important. And it's part of the legislative body. I'm sorry if you're feeling offended by it, but this is part of our legislative process. So I will continue to allow questions on this subject. I have already like had conversations with other people, SLDC, the administration, multiple other stakeholders over the past week about this. And we'll continue to do so, you know, as necessary. I appreciate your question. Do you have any other questions, Alderwoman? Alderwoman Boyd. Okay. Uh, Alderwoman Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have actually do have a few questions. Um, 
I appreciate uh, everybody who has taken the time to speak today. Thanks for thanks for coming. Um, particularly Mr. Brennan, my question, I had some questions about sort of lighting and birds and um, and uh, wildlife effect there. I think you addressed those um, that as we're, you know, as we're, we're talking about a lighthouse project and one of the most important corridors for um, for birds coming across the country. Um, I think that's really important to note um, that they're that this is going to have an impact on on vital wildlife. Um, I, you know, and granted that that is still up for conversation about what that effect is going to be, but I, I appreciate you raising that. Um, and um, I guess one of my 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 main questions I think are from Mr. Wellenkamp, um, if he is still with us. I see his name still on here. Yes, I am still here. I can't oh. be on video, but I can I can certainly voice. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you're okay with that, can I still ask him some questions if he is not able to be on video? I'm fine with that. He's already been sworn in while on video. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Wellenkamp, I very much appreciate your your weighing in today. Um, I, I, I'm aware that we just hosted a major conference of the Missouri River or the, the River Cities, um, Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative um, here in St. Louis. And we had, do you know how many cities we had attending here? Yes, we had um, just about 40 cities. Okay, so 40 cities that are invested in the in the the life and the health of our of our rivers here. Um, I, was there was there any discussion of this development at the conference that you're aware of? Yes, there was. Um, okay. it, it not in uh, not in open forum, I would say, as an organized agenda item. It came up. Uh, in the planning process of the initial opening press conference. Um, and that's because what we do for whenever we have a, um, uh, wherever our annual meeting is being hosted, we put together um, issues that may come up for the host mayor and the regional mayors around that host cities that may come up. And this was one of the items that we discussed in the uh, pre-press planning process, this project, uh, but not just this project, also the, the terminal project, the, the um, terminal project planned for further south, just south of downtown, that one also came up. Uh, so a, a number of regional projects along the Mississippi River that are pertinent to the St. Louis region came up and they were they were talked about and it was during that process that concerns were voiced. Um, I, I don't want to even say concerns, more like just, just questions. Um, sure. uh, because so many of our cities have gone through developments that just didn't pan out because they weren't equipped to deal with our new climate reality. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a loss for the city. And, um, and, and it was just, you know, we were asked to, to make sure to just voice that safety tip, I guess you yeah. could say, in the process going forward. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, one of the things that you said that stuck with me the most was that these other mayors encouraged that we get involved and we set parameters and we set these expectations, these safety guidelines um, as soon as possible in the process. And you stated that we're really at that point now, um, that this is this is the time to have those, those conversations, to set those in place. Um, are there any like I, I'm wondering because we don't have any of the rest of those mayors in front of us right now. What what types of well, if this is the only opportunity that the board of aldermen here in the city of St. Louis has to weigh in on this project, um, trying to figure out how we set in place those guidelines. I am I am well aware that there are Missouri state guidelines, that there are federal guidelines, that there are. Coast Guard guidelines, you know, all of those um, those regulations that are there. But as far as community specific standards and practices and, and expectations that we have, this is our it is it your understanding? Like this is our moment to do that, right? Before this gets out of our hands and into these other regulatory agencies. I am I am certainly not an expert to the uh, to the administrative legal structure for the city of St. Louis on how sure. projects are because uh, you know like it, it there is a different it's a variation on a theme up and down the river all the different cities have different variations on this theme um 
I would say the the Mississippi River is going through a much overdue and most welcomed renaissance period right now. Even even in the midst of these climate impacts, it's going through an an incredible renaissance. And and some you know, in some degree, the climate impacts are responsible for bringing some of that attention back to the river, uh, that it is a major asset, that we depend on it so much. The cruise line industry, never, last time we had three cruise lines operating on the full river was a century ago. Uh, so this is, this is a, a fantastic opportunity. And please do not get us wrong, uh, the, the association and all of our cities want to help each individual city get more people to the river to see it to recreate on it to appreciate it to interact with it of course safely and with minimal impact to the environmental services that so much of the corridor depends on so to to alderwoman boyd's point i'm completely sensitive to her to her point um our our co-chair is the mayor of greenville mississippi uh, black mayor. Our immediate past co-chair is the is the mayor, current mayor of of Baton Rouge, Mayor uh, Sharon Westenbroom, first black woman mayor in that city's 300 year history. Uh, so it it is, you know, the completely all of our our mayors up and down the river can completely uh, understand uh, that point for sure. And we're not here to get in in the way of this development at all. Um, knowing how it's working going forward to because alderman alderman excuse me grass asked the question and mr or if i misstate this uh, please let me know um but what i have seen our other communities do that have a similar administrative setup to to st louis is once it leaves the alderman or the city council and goes into agency review which is sounds like that's where it's going next that a detailed letter is sent from the um, city council or the board of aldermen uh, detailing their concerns um, so that those concerns can be maintained through the rest of the administrative process. And the agency review can be cognizant and use that those concerns in, in creating a better project moving along in detail. That's what I have seen uh, in the past. Um, it is, uh, it is a great thing that this project is of interest, and it is a great thing that these partners have come together to bit to create this development along our great river, and that is certainly welcome. It's part of the renaissance I talked about. It's just that we want to make sure this project is can survive the climate reality we find ourselves in. And sometimes that means bringing on new capacities that aren't typically brought on, thinking about things that aren't typically uh, concerned for above the federal level. Um, and we wanna make sure that those go through. So if, if that's helpful, that's what I have seen other communities do that have a similar administrative process to ensure the agencies are, uh, the, agencies, the agency that takes custody of the project from here on out is well-versed and well cognizant of those concerns, if that's helpful. That, that's incredibly helpful. Um, understanding that we are the elected representatives of our, of our region and that this, you know, if this is the only time that we have to, you know, put a, put the brakes on a project or accelerate a project, um, you know, and really, um, really weigh in as elected representatives, then and I just want to be cognizant of, of using that power um, well, um, that if if we need to be if we need to be asking or not just asking the questions, but but putting in our real community guidelines around, you know, what what is the the best use of this? What is the safest use? What is it that that we as a community want to see out of the project? Um, the the timing is important on that. So thank you. That was that was helpful. Um, I, I guess why my last question is because this is in such a unique part of the city of St. Louis, um, are, have there been conversations with uh, St. Louis County, with the municipality of Spanish Lake, um, since this is most closely abuts that property? And I think the nearest St. Louis city residences are fairly far away, if, if, my, if my map is 
uh, correct on that. Um, I'm not sure who the best person to ask that of. Perhaps the sponsor, or maybe M2 or Rob. I'm not sure. Hey, I saw Mr. Orr's hand raise. Rob, do you care to answer that, or do you prefer someone else handle it? I'm sorry, I missed the last part of the. Of the question. <laughs> I did have a comment related to what Colin mentioned. Can you repeat the question? Okay. I, all sure. one race. Uh, yeah. So just quickly, um, because this is because this uh, this particular property is right up against Spanish Lake, right against the county. I believe the nearest St. Louis City homes are are fairly far from that area. What conversations have happened with St. Louis County with Spanish Lake um, as as far as this goes? Um, to my knowledge, um, none with SLDC. The developer may have had conversations with those other municipalities and jurisdictions. Okay. And I, I this is Dan Cook. And we have uh, had some conversations with Spanish Lake uh, and also with the uh, representatives and the senators, uh, the state representatives and state senators that cover those districts that are partly within the county as well. Okay. Okay, I'm um, thinking about you know, as uh, as Mr. Brennan raised the infrastructure that's going to be needed um, to carry traffic up in that area and to make sure that that folks are um, able to access access uh, all of these developments and things. So um, that's I think that's I think that I had oh I'm sorry, Mr. Orr, you said you had a, a response on the about the sort of timing and. Um, Sort of qualifications that piece that I was just asking uh, Mr. Wellenkamp about. Well, I was going to suggest that you know Colin mentioned that the in other municipalities that he's worked with that the um, board of aldermen or the legislative body would share its concerns with the agency that would then take the project forward, which in this case would be the uh, port authority. We would welcome such a letter, and we would certainly entertain future conversations with what that development looks like. You know, this developer is looking for an economically feasible uh, project. And with this resolution getting passed and understanding that there is an opportunity for incentives, if they can check all of the boxes, they can obtain all of the permits from all the regulatory agencies that are necessary, that then the Port Authority would consider what those um, incentives and the appropriate level. And we would certainly uh, entertain that conversation at the appropriate time once the developer can move forward and actually begin some of that earnest and due diligence work that's required uh, prior to uh, finalizing and um, seeking building permits and, and construction permits. Okay, that is also helpful. Um, just understanding you know, our piece as the directly elected officials um, versus Port Authority that's appointed. And um, I, I understand our, our chairman here sits on the Port Authority as well, but um, that, is, that is helpful um, to know that this is not the last, our last opportunity to, to weigh in um, that, that helps with some of my concerns here as well. So um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all the questions that I have. If I could just follow up and reiterate again, the Port Authority takes the Mississippi River very seriously. This is a great regional asset. We are not interested in seeing development that hurts the commerce that occurs on the river, that in, endangers individuals, that influences negatively the environment. And so we, we want, just as all of you want, we want to have a good project at the end of the day. And so we will do our best to make sure that that happens before any final incentives are approved. Sure, thank you. I just, and just very quickly, Mr. Chairman, just to address, I, you know, I, I think we are all excited about this area getting getting development. And like Alderman Narayan said, um, the types of uh, you know hotel and entertainment and and that type of thing in this area is incredible, and we are excited about it. And I I don't want to be mistaken that this is. If this were happening on the south side of St. Louis, on the south part of the river, I would have these exact same concerns about how we utilize the Mississippi River. Um, I think the there, you know, the it it we owe it to the country and our highest and best use of our river. Um, there there are states out west that are contemplating attempting to pipe water from our area out to their to their desert areas at the moment. I mean, we are we are in a a climate situation where we're going to have to be very smart and very intentional about our uses of water. And so this is this is not about it being on the north side or the south side. This is this is about the river. Um, and so I I it 
it sucks that it that this is the first major development to happen in this area and that it's it's on such a vital and um delicate resource um that requires all of this questioning um but that that truly is um that's at least my motivation and um the motivation of a lot of constituents that have raised concerns with me as well so um thank you so much mr chairman okay i i mr jaf uh you have your hand raised yeah mr chairman i wanted to put a very small input that uh regarding what uh, colin uh, was saying about the the river about the river cruises we could easily at this point do a, a feasibility or market study for river cruises in the mississippi river and if possible put some type of flexible docking for broad broadside docking for a relatively interesting size of, of a cruise that would also create a possibility of, of for the for St. Louis to receive uh, cruises in the site, right? Okay, thank you. I I, I appreciate that. We I think I have uh, one more colleague that has questions or did. Uh, is Alderwoman and Gracia still on? I I just saw her name. Uh, earlier. Does any other woman uh, Hubbard, I see that you're on. Do you have any questions? Okay. Uh, can people hear me? <laughs> okay. Uh, so we'll go ahead. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, I believe there are people who are registered to uh, speak in favor and opposition to this. Uh, can we go ahead and start taking their testimony? Hi, Alderman. Um, Tracy got kicked off, so I am actually pulling the list up now. Okay, thanks, Sharita. Yeah, second. No problem. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was just going to say, if you have to get to that trunk or treat, I'm certainly able to go back and forth, just throwing that out there. But if you've already missed it, then that's also the time. I appreciate it. It lasts until 7.30, so I'm hoping that uh, <laughs> we have a little bit of time left at the end here that I can make it over there still, but it it did start about an hour ago. So, Mr. Chair, I have uh, members of the public. Is that who you want to start with? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and can someone reach out to Alderwoman Ingracia to see if she plans to rejoin? I'll call her. Thank you. So the first person in member of, I'm sorry, the members of the public that are in support of it is Tashara Earl. Is that how you pronounce the name? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Okay, is everyone able to hear me? We are. Uh, you just need to okay. uh, take the oath. Uh, it's sworn in, Madam Clerk. Sure. If you would raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. There you go, Madam. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Go ahead uh, and, and provide your uh, testimony. I am asking if people could keep it to three minutes as we're running over time. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairman, Vice Chair Vicario and the City of St. Louis Board of Aldermen Transportation and Commence Committee. Hello, my name is Tashara Earl from the Bay Neighborhood also within the current ward of this new development opportunity. I am in favor of the resolution 110 for the following reasons. To be a resident of North St. Louis, I value an all inclusive community to give families the opportunity to be safe and to live, work and play. This new lighthouse point development for, North, for Riverfront North provides an opportunity for North St. Louis to thrive for all. The projected 511 jobs that are being created in this location provides easy access to commute for people within the neighboring communities like Baden. Those jobs are 
Those jobs give people the opportunity to gain skills, a career, a living wage to provide for their families and a path towards a better life. Also, the development, the economic development bridges that gap and creates an opportunity for more tourism and visitation, which brings in an ample amount of tax dollars to North St. Louis City and the state of Missouri. The opportunities that uh, St. Louis, this puts St. Louis on the map for national and international attractions as well. For my family and I to indulge in these types of activities that are proposed for the Lighthouse Point project, I will have to commute 30 minutes to St. Charles or Chesterfield or about three hours to Lake of the Ozarks, which takes the tax dollars away from St. Louis City. When I ride my bike along the Riverfront Trail, viewing the Mississippi River with the industrial commercial boats cruising down the river, I desire to have more sceneries, activities, and attractions to promote that creativity, the healthy living, and the endless STL-made possibilities. I will ask on behalf of my community for the developers to consider going into an agreement to contribute funds directly to the neighborhoods of Baden, Riverfront, North, and also Riverview for the revitalization efforts to improve our communities and also to meet with the community organizations to learn of those community needs that the funds will support. Also, I ask for M2 development to go into an agreement with North St. Louis community organizations to preserve a certain amount of jobs for people in the Baden Riverview and North Riverfront neighborhoods. With all this in mind, North St. Louis has the land, the developer, and the proper organizations and agencies in place to make this happen and to make sure the environment is safe. North St. Louis hasn't seen a major investment as this such in years and now is the perfect time to support this tax incentive to make this happen, not just for North St. Louis, but for the entire St. Louis metropolitan area. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tashara Earl, I appreciate that. I, just a question, did you by chance have uh, that in a written format that you'd be able to submit if you haven't already? Yes. Wonderful, uh, if you could, uh, did you already email it to the clerk? I did not. Would you like a signature on this as well with the date? That's, that's not necessary if you're emailing it, but um, I do want to make sure that, that you read off those neighborhoods pretty quickly and I, I got two out of them. So if uh, if you could send that over to the clerk so that I have that and can use it in future discussions, that would be awesome. Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, uh, the next person. The next speaker we have is Sihara. Simreal? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Sarah, do you promise or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Sierra Simreal. I'm a resident of North City in Ward 27 in North Point neighborhood. I'm here today to speak in favor of this resolution that collectively brings development to the North Corridor. The Lighthouse Project is essential for our community and has a lot of concerns have been answered during this meeting. If you take a moment to focus on the environmental issues of the North Side, who can express it best than a resident of this area? For far too long, residents have survived living in blighted environments, food deserts, school closures, and vacant buildings. I've heard more concern for the wildlife than I have for the residents that live in this area. We have an opportunity to explore what this area could be in the future. In my opinion, this project is necessary for residents of this city, more specifically of the area. It's important to see growth in blighted areas and provide jobs. Taking it a step further, our children deserve to see something meaningful and exciting in their community. As you know, this project would include a marina, a water park, themed hotel, restaurant, support, and supporting retail. It's safe to say that many people of the community haven't seen such sites or traveled outside of the city. It's been overdue for the opportunity to offer diversity to families of this community. We speak of jobs and education when it's convenient, but when it comes to development on the north side, it's always a debate. It seems, to many, it seems to many times the excuses of what's acceptable or dissecting projects of such. We have an opportunity to offer numerous opportunities to this area, home purchases, offer tourist engagements while creating and rebuilding the community. 
I find it disheartening and disappointing to learn that any older person would deny a development as such while saying that they're in support of all city residents. The Lighthouse Landing Project is to create 511 new living wage jobs for the city and expand the tax base of North St. Louis. This is needed to give a chance for people that live in the area to feel like they're contributing to their home base. We have to stop thinking inside of personal agendas and must consider what we wish to see beyond our time. We must consider the possibilities of what could be, what we can be with moving forward on this project. I look forward to having this project in my backyard and not having to travel downtown for everything. It's needed, wanted, and supported. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk. Uh, the next person we have in support is Jean Barnett. Jean Barnett. Okay. Um, I have speakers in opposition. That's okay. Mr. Charles Miller. Okay, Mr. Miller. Yes. Do you swear to affirm, I'm sorry, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And Thank you. Mr. Miller, may I add, I know that you were part of our hearing last week. Uh, can you kind of constrain your remarks to anything pertinent or new from the conversation from last week? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to thank the committee for having such a robust process around this. The main thing I wanted to bring up this week uh, does involve the marina aspect of the project. Um, chemicals uh, and metals in boat paint and cleaners um, include chlorine, ammonia, phosphates, and copper. Um, um, ammonia and phosphates are already kind of major pollutants of concern in Missouri and Illinois. Um, and there's been studies that show huge spikes in copper concentrations uh, after the installations of new marinas. Uh, and copper is a regulated drinking water contaminant. Um, again, as several folks have pointed out, this is a, right upstream of the intakes from the chain of rocks. And uh, we simply believe at Missouri Confluence Waterkeeper that it's, it's too risky to introduce those kinds of dangerous pollutants right above the public drinking water intake for the entire city of St. Louis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. We have Jerry Connolly. Jerry yeah. Connolly. Okay. Next, we have Laura Cohen. I am available. Oh, okay. Sorry about okay. that. I just had to scoot my screen around. <laughs> No problem. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. And Jerry, I would ask the same. Uh, you testified before committee last week. Uh, I'm asking folks to stick to a three minute time period here. And if you, since you did testify last week, if you could kind of keep your remarks to uh, anything that might be new or relevant to the discussion that we've had today. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'll focus my remarks on questions I asked last week that were not answered. Uh, some of those did get answered today. Um, so first of all, Chairman Cohen, uh, committee members, other members of the Board of Aldermen, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I urge you to either hold this resolution in committee today or to vote no. Uh, why? SLDC and the Board of Aldermen have not completed their due diligence on the project. The environment, the public, and funding for schools and city services are all in jeopardy if this project moves forward without the proper scrutiny. You need to hear directly from all relevant government agencies and other experts on the subject matter. I'm very glad that we've heard from um, Mr. Wellenkamp, um, from the gentleman with Edgewater, because I've learned a lot today. We also had an SLDC presentation today. We did not have a comprehensive SLDC presentation at any of the three meetings last week. So board bills 94 and 95 for the taxing districts were approved by HUDs and Ways and Means uh, respectively. And there was no one from SLDC staff present at those meetings. 
or to answer questions that myself and other people speaking and even some of the commission uh, committee members brought up. Uh, city government and SLDC has failed to implement any of the recommendations from the 2019 audit report on taxing districts performed by State Order Galloway staff. We need full clarification on how the Port Authority incentives work. If the Board of Aldermen does not approve this resolution for tax incentives, can the Port Authority still authorize the tax incentives? That's a question for SLDC and the Board and Legal Counsel. Um, the Port Authority resolution that was approved back in September, um, here it is, Port Authority Resolution PT27, it doesn't mention tax in the actual nature of the tax incentives, and it also doesn't use the word environment one time in the whole uh, resolution. So what I'm concerned about is who is actually making this incentive recommendation to the Board of Aldermen? Um, 110 was introduced on September 30th, which was 11 days before the date on the developer's application that I received via a Sunshine request. So when SODC performed this financial analysis, on what data did they perform it and when was it performed? This might sound pedantic, but I think this process is really important when we've got you know, a net present value of incentives of $35 million from the city and an additional $8 million. I mean, this is a huge project and we need to have all the analysis done. I, I think the environmental information needs to be assessed first before we can really get a sense of the merits of the project. Um, I think those cover my main points. Thank you for the opportunity, Chairman. I thank you. Uh, I know that there was a, a response, I believe, uh, Daniel, the attorney for M2, sent a, a letter of response to some of the concerns that were brought forward to the committee. He has not had an opportunity to speak. I, I, I'm not sure if he's still on the line or not, but uh, you know, I would welcome him you know, to provide any responses that he might have uh, that he, Madam Clerk, is he still on the line? I do not see him. Okay. No, I do not see him. Oh, uh, I'm still here. I, okay. I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Took me a second to get that video back up. Yeah, uh, Mr. Cook, if if you wouldn't mind, I, and I I know we're uh, kind of running on two and a half hours of a meeting here, uh, but uh, Mr. Connolly just brought up the uh, some of the questions that were asked at the last week's meeting. Uh, I know you sent a letter uh, in response to some of the concerns that were brought up throughout the course of the committee hearing last week. Um, if you, you know, wouldn't mind just indulging us with some of those responses. Did you hear the, the questions from Mr. Connolly? I, I thought most of them were actually addressed to SLDC. Is there one directly for the developer, Mr. Connolly? Jerry, you're muted. Last week, oh, sorry. There's some questions from last week, but I think that the key one really is for SLDC and, you know, Council for the Board of Aldermen regarding whether the Port Authority has the capability to authorize the incentives without the Board of Aldermen approving this resolution. Yeah, I don't feel qualified to- Yeah, I, sorry, stuff. sorry, Dan, I didn't, uh, I, sorry. Yep, no, I, is there, Rob, are you still on the line? I don't. I am. I believe that the answer is that the um, port could actually approve the incentives. This is an advisory resolution, but our relationship with the Board of Aldermen is obviously crucial in everything we do. And we greatly value the, the conversation and the, um, the questions that are being asked. And we certainly take our role very seriously and um, we are not going to do anything that would severely jeopardize our ability to continue to function as an agency by um, blatantly going against the will of the Board of the Aldermen. Okay, I, I'm gonna try and keep the meeting moving a little bit. Uh, Madam Clerk, if we could move to the uh, 
Next speaker. Next speaker is Laura Cohen. Here. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. I'll be very brief. I'm a city resident and I was the Confluence Project Director at TrailNet for 15 years with the goal of reconnecting people to the rivers through a system of public open space, um, trails and historic sites. Um, it's very exciting to see the interest um, in this area. Um, the zoos project is tremendous and work that's gone on for years. Um, it's, this is really an exciting opportunity. But like others have expressed, it's a very comp a special and complex area um, with a lot of environmental aspects. The flooding is something that, you know, I mean, what are we going to do when this area floods and who's going to pay for the cost of repairs and things like that? And it just seems to me, as other speakers have expressed, that um, maybe some of these issues could be further explored before um, the aldermen in the city make the commitment to these kinds of incentives. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. I'll note uh, she and I are not related. The names are spelled differently, but Thank you. Uh, I often get called Cohen. So uh, just point of clarification there. I believe that's all the speakers we have. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. I appreciate it. I, I don't know if there's any other questions from members of the committee. Uh, anyone, any other alder people that might have questions or follow up at this point? Okay, uh, there's a lot of feedback that was provided and questions that were asked this uh, this meeting. So I'm going to go ahead and hold this and, and get a, a time to schedule for uh, next week um, to uh, continue this conversation here. Um, I know the older woman from the second ward, uh, she and I have had some conversations. I need to circle back with you. If you don't mind, I'll give you a call after the meeting so that we can talk through that a little bit. Um, but you know, otherwise, uh, I I need to get <laughs> to a neighborhood event here. Um, I spent the good portion of last night before bed stuffing uh, bags with candy and toothbrushes for this trunk or treat. So I'd like to be able to get there to participate with uh, my fellow Dutch townies. But um, you know, with that, uh, you know, I will uh, entertain a motion that we adjourn for this evening. I will make that motion. I okay. can't. All right, with that, the Transportation and Commerce meeting is adjourned.